Now, I know I promised you a flat earth challenge from Santos this week, but I need a little bit more time to gather some things together for that one. But don't worry, I still have a Santos video for you. And this time he claims he's got proof, actual proof that all globe believers, normal people, are dumb as dog sh Welcome along to another episode of Flat Earth Friday with me, Simon Dan. Thank you very much for joining me. Before we begin today, a huge thank you to the sponsors of today's video, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is a VPN service that makes online privacy protection easy and attainable, encrypting all internet traffic sent to and from your devices and ensuring that your IP address remains hidden to make sure nobody can see what you do online. On top of that, they block ads, trackers, malware and phishing attempts and unlike other VPN services, you can use it on as many devices as you like simultaneously. Right, come on, it's 2023. We all know now we spend more time on our devices and online than we have ever done before, sometimes up to six to eight hours per day. The internet knows a hell of a lot about us and it's why we should care about our online data. So use Surfshark to encrypt your personal information and send it via a secure VPN tunnel so that no one can see it without your permission which is great for protecting things like your ID. Now Surfshark and its HackLock system will give you alerts anytime your email address or password is compromised. HackLock scans various databases of leaked information and then notifies its users if their data is found so then you can take action. Click on the link in the description or go to surfshark.deals slash simandan and use my code simandan to get that whopping 83% off and three months extra free. Right, back to today's video, which is good old Santos sitting at his desk ready to destroy us globies definitely face palm protection required for this one people here we go like on a whiteboard so we have four motions <clears throat> now these are the two first ones that you taught in kindergarten the rotation of the earth giving you the day at a thousand three hundred and fifty mile an hour at the equator There's the equator. That's roughly Mark 1.3. So 1.3 times the speed of sound. Okay, first off, I don't think that anyone is taught in preschool that the Earth is rotating. Officially, here in the UK, you don't learn about that sort of stuff till you're about nine or 10 years old. You certainly aren't taught that the Earth revolves at Mach 1.3. By the way, Santos, this linear speed figure is totally irrelevant anyway. Rotational speed is measured in radians per second, which for the Earth is around 7.3 times 10 to the minus five, or it's 15 degrees per hour. Sorry everyone, but I have now retired the 15 degree per hour clip out of respect for the recently passed Bob Nodell, who was the main person in it. Then the Earth is rotating around the Sun every year at 660... Yes, yeah, Santos, you're an authority about the Earth in space, but you can't even read a number out correctly. 66,600 mile an hour, 666. Actually, the average speed is 66,616. But of course, Santos finds a way to slip the devil in there to suit his narrative. Very important to note though, that this is an average speed. Of course, the Earth's orbit is elliptical and it moves at different speeds at different stages in its orbit. Its fastest speed is 67,752 miles per hour and its slowest speed is 65,520 miles per hour. And that's roughly Mark 88. By the way, what a pointless way of looking at it. The speed of sound in space is zero. Another interesting number. But see, what they don't factor in is that our sun is orbiting the Milky Way galaxy. And they don't tell you how long it takes for it to do that. They do, between 225 and 250 million years. But they tell you that it's doing 550,000 mile an hour which is Mark 718. Take note, that's 718 times faster than the speed of sound. There is no material known to man that can withstand something between 20 and 30 Mark. 
it pulverizes everything and anything they've ever tried to go faster than 27 mark. Yes, Santos, because Earth's atmosphere plays a big part in that. Once you get up to those speeds, the air friction is insane. In space, the speed of sound is zero. There's no air to get in the way in space, is there? Now, our Milky Way galaxy is actually orbiting what they call the center of the universe or the central sun. Never heard of that. And that is 650 million miles an hour, which translates to 870,000 mark. Now, I don't know where Santos got that number from. Now, as far as I know, the Milky Way galaxy is moving at a speed of around 1.3 million miles per hour. And it's not really orbiting anything either. It's kind of moving through space with a local supercluster of galaxies. Now, their retort when you say, how can this be possible? Their retort is, well, it's, it's space, it's a vacuum. Well, let's have a look at what vacuum means, shall we? Oh, here we go, Santos the Googler. Dictionary. A space entirely devoid of matter. Well, why would this article here in New Scientist, solar system caught in an interstellar tempest, why would it say this? The solar system is travelling through much stormier skies than we thought and might even be about to pop out of a huge gas, gas cloud. We have been gliding through for at least 45,000 years. That's the implication of a multi-decade survey of interstellar and wind buffeting the solar so a system, which has revealed an unexpected change in the wind's direction. Wind in a vacuum? Yes, Santos, wind in a vacuum. Once again, you're talking about your earthly experiences to talk about space. Solar wind is a thing. Planetary winds are a thing. Now, they aren't a wind in the sense of the word here on Earth, of course. They refer to the movement of gases and charged particles through space. And okay, space is not a perfect vacuum, but I don't think you can ever get one of those but it's so close to a perfect vacuum space that for all intents and purposes, we can call it a vacuum. And obviously there are objects in space which move through a vacuum from time to time. Stars, planets, nebulae, gas clouds, dust clouds, etc., etc. Gas in a vacuum. Gas is matter. It is one of the four states of matter. Plasma, gas, liquid and solid. How does gas become matter bit of a weird question that one santos gas is already matter well they change uh, water freezes and from liquid becomes a solid thanks for that mate i'm sure we all had a problem understanding that one gas uh, produces what's called um deposition Oh my days, this is cringe. Gas produces deposition. You mean deposition is the process of a gas turning directly to a solid? And becomes solid. Gas can be solid or liquid. Groundbreaking stuff here from Santos today. Depending on how it transitions into that state. So you can't have a vacuum and gas. And by the way, isn't it interesting how in this article they're pointing over here? Have a look at this. Can't see that, mate. Too far away. There's our sun, and the sun, it says, direction of sun's motion. Oh. And where is it pointing to? Well, it's pointing away from Sirius, directly away from Sirius, which is behind it. Therefore, we should be able to look at those stars and we should be able to teach our, our generations of, of intelligent children to come. See those stars over there? That's where we're headed at Mark 870,000. What? Are those stars not moving too then? Of course they are, but Santos can't get that into his tiny 2D brain. Which translates to... 5 trillion... 
694 billion miles every year. Now, if we're traveling at five to six trillion miles every year, you'd think those stars over there where we're heading toward would get brighter, and those stars that we're going away from would get dimmer and eventually disappear. Santos, everything in the galaxy is orbiting that central mass, including all of the stars in the night sky, which, by the way, are all inside this little yellow circle. But it takes so long to orbit that central mass that in the last 50,000 years, we have moved through approximately 0.022% of that orbit. Now, that is not to say that we don't see the stars move over time, because we do. Barnard's star has the largest proper motion of any star in the night sky, and can be seen to move against the backdrop of stars over a few mere years. This one fact alone proves that not everything rotates around us. And yet, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, Pisces, in the same shape that the, they were as recorded by the Egyptians and the Mayans at least 500,000 years ago, same shape, no distortion, no parallax, every year, same old stars. Sorry, did he just say that the Egyptians and the Mayans lived 500,000 years ago? And again, what you're saying is not true. The constellations do change over time, including the position of the North Star. In fact, during the times of the Egyptians, the North Star was Thuban, not Polaris. However, that change of the North Star is actually due to Earth's precession. It spins like a top, basically. Wonderful proof that we're moving. Come March, there's Aries. Come May, uh, April, there's Taurus, May, there's Gemini. Where are the random stars? It's a really boring show if you're a God believer. God, you're very disappointing. Uh, we're traveling at 870,000 mark and there's nothing new to show us in the skies. Um, and if you're an atheist, yeah, I'd be, um, I'd be really angry at the Big Bang Theory because the Big Bang is hurtling you through space at 870,000 mark, and it's not even showing you anything interesting that's new and random in the skies. It's just those same stars, and Polaris is still there. We haven't gone past it. Keep going, and always in the same coordinates, always, always, always. Sirius has always been six hours and 45 minutes right ascension of Meridian, and 19 degrees south declination since time immemorial. Well, that's really funny because a hundred years ago, Sirius was at six hours 41 minutes right ascension, and a thousand years ago, it was at six hours two minutes right ascension. It's almost as if we aren't the center of everything, isn't it? But Santo, they do take pictures of new stars. They're called nebulas. NASA shows us images all the time of new nebulas. Can you touch on that? Nebulas. <laughs> No, no, me, I'm going with what you yeah, said, I because they just paint something and say, look what we found. Yeah. It's all composite. Yeah. yeah. You have to remember that those nebulas and explosions and new things in the skies that sh scientists show us, they are CGI images. They're not photos. Okay, so they're showing what they want you to believe. They're showing you that there's this infinite space and... Um, it's a vacuum and yet it's got stars in it. So, yeah, well, we won't talk about that, will we? Why is there always fear about, oh, one day we're going to crash into some comet, some comet's going to come from nowhere, some, some meteorite, some meteor, something space junk, you know, something scary? Um, probably because uh, it doesn't exist. In Disneyland it does but uh, not in reality. No, it's because they actually are real threats. That is why. Well, there we go. Poor old Santos getting confused about a lot of things again there. And that, of course, means we are done and dusted for another Flat Earth Friday. I do hope you enjoyed this one. Um, always love looking at Santos's videos, bless him. Please do consider subscribing if you enjoyed it. Uh, and of course, if you liked the video, then hit that like button. 
If you like it, hit the like, why not? Um, there will be more Santos stuff coming up. I've, I've talked about the challenge and there'll also be another Santos Tartaria one as well. Just enough time to once again thank Surfshark for sponsoring today's video. Remember, click the link in the description or go to surfshark.deal slash simandan and use my code simandan to get the 83% off and three months extra free. I've been Simon Dan, have yourselves a great weekend. And as I said, Tuesday will be Santos and a Tartaria mud flood tour. See you then.